Good morning, Acts day 14, our final day and chapters 27 and 28. Today we read about Paul's perilous voyage to Rome, his eventual arrival in Rome, having performed a miraculous ministry on the island of Malta before that, having been shipwrecked there, and then his ministry in Rome, um, particularly to the Jewish people as they came and they asked him about the way, this Christian way. So I want to comment from a verse in uh, chapter 27 and the point I want to make simply is that God is willing to do good to the people around you, the people within your household so to speak, even if they're unbelievers. God will do the people around you good for your sake. Um, there was a, a story from the life of Jesus where he was on his way to Jerusalem and they wanted to pass through a town of the Samaritans and the Samaritans knowing that they were on their way to Jerusalem and they hated the Jews would not allow them to, to pass through their city. And James and John say to Jesus, shall we call down fire upon the city and have them destroyed just like Elijah did? And uh, Jesus said, you don't know what manner of spirit you are, of, uh, you are of because I didn't come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. God is good and God is far more patient than we are. And God does good to all men and women, even the most wretched sinner. God still looks upon them kindly and he does them good. As long as there is breath in their lungs, as long as the sun shines on them and the rain falls on them, as long as they have a meal to eat and something to drink every day, it is the provision and sustaining power of God that is granting them that God is good to all. And we see that in today's reading. So let's just remind ourselves who is on this ship with Paul. First of all, uh, a couple of Paul's ministry companions, Luke being one of them, Aristarchus being another one. So there's some Christians on board. Then we've got Roman soldiers. Uh, these men, pretty brutal men, they, in fact, when the ship has been um, stranded, the, the, the fellow prisoners are wanting to jump off and the soldiers just want to kill the prisoners. Um, I mean, these are pretty, pretty hectic men. So Roman soldiers. Then we've got fellow prisoners. So these are criminals. And then we've got the sailors who are responsible for the ship, the owner of the ship and his crew. And they're also a pretty shifty bunch of people because we see them trying to desert the soldiers and the prisoners when the thing is being shipwrecked. They, they, are, uh, they pretend that they're trying to let down the little lifeboat, but actually they were just going to flee and, and leave everyone to die. So this is a pretty motley crew of people. A motley crew, that's a good word for them because they were a crew. And... Um, after much struggle and hardship, okay, I mean, God could have just allowed there to be no storm and could, could have found some other reason to get Paul onto Malta. Because what's happening here is God has a divine appointment for Paul in Malta before he gets to Rome. God loves the people of Malta. Um, God loves Publius, who is the chief citizen of that island, whose father is dying of dysentery. And there are a whole bunch of natives on that island who then, when Publius's father gets healed by Paul, all the natives come and they're all healed. God is granting dramatic miracles of healing on that island. And many of them would have been saved as Paul would have been preaching the gospel to them. So God has this sort of diversion that he's going to do, but he could have found some other way to do it. Instead, what does he do? There's much hardship which Paul and his companions have to face in order to do this diversion to Malta. God has to shipwreck the ship on Malta and have many days of, of fear and panic. And in fact, the dream that Paul has could have been given to him before he even got on the ship. God could have said to him, look, I need, you, I need to prepare you for something that's going to happen. But he didn't do that. He let him go for many, many, many days fasting. They all, they, at one point it says they actually gave up all hope of survival. They thought they were going to die. And only after much struggle and fear and panic does God appear to Paul in a dream and say, I will save you. We are going to run aground. You are going to run aground on an island. 
and all the men on the ship are are going to survive with you. And I want to read that verse to you. It's uh, from verse 21. But after long abstinence from food, then Paul stood in the midst of them and said, Men, you should have listened to me and not have sailed from Crete and incurred this disaster and loss. And now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For there stood by me this night an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve, saying, Do not be afraid, Paul. You must be brought before Caesar, and indeed God has granted you all those who sail with you. God has granted you all those who sail with you. Therefore take heart, men, for I believe that it will be just as it was told me. However, we must run aground on a certain island. So Paul had obviously been told by this angel, you're going to be shipwrecked. You're going to be shipwrecked on a certain island. There's a divine appointment for you there. But God has granted you all the men who are with you on this ship. But after that, you will go to Rome. God had plans for Paul. And Paul was, in some respects, indestructible until he had fulfilled his mission. But as he's on his journey, God is being gracious to people around him for Paul's sake. Now, as it unfolds, there's still some wrestling for the purposes of God to take place. The soldiers are trying to, es- the, sorry, the sailors are trying to escape. Then the soldiers want to put all the prisoners to death. And in each case, God uses means to achieve his ends. He uses means to, to subvert that so that all the men stay on the ship as Paul had seen in his vision. And then it gets shipwrecked and they all survive. Okay, here's the point I want to make to you. God loves people. God loves the people around you. God loves the unbelievers around you. He loves the unbelievers in your business. He loves the unbelievers in your family, in your household, staff members. He, he loves the unbelievers in, in um, circles of friends or in clubs that you're a member of. And it may be that if you call upon God, He will do the entire organization good for your sake. So is it legitimate for you to pray for the good of your company or your business and for the people around you, even though many of them are unbelievers? Is it legitimate to ask God to bless the whole company, to bless the work of all the people, to bless their families and to do the company good? Because you are there and because God's purposes for you are that you should be there. And so God, while I'm here, I believe you've called me to be here. This is part of your plan for my life. I pray you do everyone around here good. I pray for them. Bless them, God, and bless this company. Or bless the school. Bless this university. This is where you've called me to be. This is where you've called my children to be. And I'm asking you to do good to the whole school, to the whole university, to the whole company. I'm asking you to do good to everyone, God, because this is where you've called me to be. Yes, that is legitimate. That God will bless the people around you, though many of them may be unbelievers, for your sake. Because that's where he's called you to be right now. Because God loves all people. And he is good. So God bless you. And I will see you as we pick up in the book of Romans tomorrow. Cheers.